So now, uh, our first themed session of the day is on international innovations for accessible voting. So I'm very happy to welcome Annette Costello to chair this session and welcome her and the speakers to the stage. Uh, and while they're getting themselves set up on stage, I'll just give you a, a brief introduction to Annette and then I'm sure she will ably introduce the rest of the, uh, the panel for you. Um, but Annette has been very active on the issue of Article 29 as a member of the Disability Stakeholder Group that you've already heard a bit about this morning. And she's twice appeared as a witness with fellow Disability Stakeholder Group members before the Joint Oireachtas Committee on Disability Matters on the subject of public and political participation of disabled people. So this is a, a hybrid session because we have one of our speakers joining us online uh, and two others joining Annette on stage. But I will hand over to you, Annette, and best of luck for the session. Good morning everybody and further to the introductions, let's get started. Session one is International Innovations for Accessible Voting. Uh, we have three panellists here today and before each of them gives their presentation I'll introduce them. So I'll hand over now to Armin who's going to speak about electoral participation of persons with disabilities and Armin is the chairperson of Election Watch EU. So over to you Armin. Thank you very much um, and uh, good morning ladies and gentlemen and thank you for having me and uh, inviting election watch to eu and uh, alpine regards from tyrol in austria where i'm currently am. i would like to talk you through um, some research which we did uh, also on behalf of the uh, european disability forum um, just a pr i tried to forward the slide now which does not work, I think. Um, just some few words about Election Watch EU. So we are actually usually um, international observers observing elections for the European Union, um, outside of the European Union, and also for the Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe. Uh, and 10 years ago, we brought back this idea of observing elections back to the European Union and its member states. And we realized, okay, there's also need to improve our own electoral systems and uh, to strengthen them against international uh, or outside interference, disinformation, but also to raise the standards and to fulfill um, all um, the standards and commitments uh, our governments um, uh, have, have ratified. So especially the CRPD. And here in 2019, we conducted the first electoral assessment mission to the European Parliament elections across all 28 member states back then and provided a report. And we also focused on the inclusion uh, and accessibility of persons with disabilities. So we have been uh, doing a lot of advocacy work during the past four years with the European Parliament, but also with the European Cooperation Network on Elections, which uh, compiles and, 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 and convenes all the election management bodies of the member states. And um, in July this year, we had a big conference at the European Parliament, but they also presented a policy paper on the European Parliament elections, where we also talk about inclusion among others of uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities. Now, I would like to go to the next slide, which is um, the sixth uh, human rights report of EDF, and we contributed to it with our research, and you will also find it online uh, um, through this uh, QR code, which is on the next slide. It doesn't seem that my, my remote control works. Yeah, that's the one. And now we go to the next slide. Yeah, the European Parliament elections, which are upcoming between the 6th and the 9th of June 2024. Now, we have we, we had in the last election we had 750 members which were directly elected by the European citizens and eligible voters. Now this, this number has dropped to 705 um, because of the Brexit of uh, the UK. 
and then uh, it raised again by 15 recently. So now we have 720 members, which are elected. Um, what's what's important? Let me just go back one slide. Yeah. Um, What's important to notice is that there's no central election management body within the European Union or at European level. So it's de facto 27 parallel separate elections run by the electoral authorities of the member states. And there is uh, also um, a basic uh, legal framework for European elections. So, for example, every citizen, every European citizen has the right to vote and to stand where they reside. So you don't need to go back to your home country or to vote by postal ballot necessarily, but you can also vote as an Austrian in, in Germany or as a as a as an Irish in in France. There's also a common agreement there should be either proportional representation or single transferable vote system. Uh, throughout the European Union Parliament elections. And then, however, there is a variety of practices across the EU. So there's a lot of um, heterogeneity. And that's something we see on the next slide, where we see different electoral systems across the European Union. And here, you probably all know the internet voting in Estonia. But then there is also this preferential vote, which provides voters with the possibility to influence which of the candidates of political parties will be elected to the parliament. And this, we have 19 EU member states. You see them on this map in orange. And then you have the two countries with single transferable vote, which is Ireland, uh, your country, and then also Malta. And then the ones in light blue are the ones where there is no um, open list system. On the next slide, you see that there are different ways of voting. So there's, uh, for example, the marking of a ballot uh, uh, with an X, with a with a tick, with a or you circle uh, the the name or the number of the candidate or stamp like in Romania, or in other countries like in Spain, like in Sweden, like in Czech Republic, a voter can choose a ballot paper for a political party and cast the ballot paper either in an envelope or without the envelope in the ballot box. Yeah. And um, the, the preferential vote, as I said, in 19 member states can be done either by circling the number or by writing down the number of the candidate or by writing down the name of the candidate on the ballot paper. So depending on which country you are, you know, you might have more complications of, of, of and, 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 and more detail to attend to that. And then it's the placing of the ballot box, the, the ballot into the ballot box, which is sometimes done by the voter, but most often, but in two countries, this is done by the presiding office in the polling station. And you have also the casting of the vote uh, through voting machines, which is still done in parts of Belgium, not everywhere, and through the website uh, in Estonia, where you can vote from home on your computer, but you can also then decide, okay, I still would like to go to the polling station on election day and then could override your previous um, casted vote. Um, let me go to the next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> there are different options and, and, and provisions by member states regarding uh, uh, making voting more easier for its citizens those who are not at home on, on election day or those homebound voters. So for example, you have early in-person voting in 11 member states. So you see that here in, on the map in orange. So in these 11 member states, citizens and eligible voters can go early uh, to either the polling station or to a magistrate to cast their vote already. Like in Austria, this is possible that you vote already by with your postal ballot at, at the municipality. On the next slide, you see that there's also in-country postal voting possible. So that's not very common. It's only uh, um, available in nine countries here in orange, like Spain, but also in Ireland and, and Germany and Poland, where you can um, cast a postal ballot, which, which is especially useful for those 
persons uh, who are homebound or could not um, access the polling stations on election day. When you when we go to the next slide, you will see that you can also have the option of choosing a different polling station where you think um, uh, this polling station is not accessible for me as a voter. You could opt uh, to uh, go to a different polling station. This is possible in in uh, 18, poll 18 member states altogether. You see them in light blue on this map. Yeah, and then it's possible in two uh, countries. Uh, in Portugal and in Finland, in certain uh, for for a certain group of persons with disabilities, to change the polling station for early in-person voting, and then you have the countries in orange here, seven, uh, which do not permit any change of polling station locations. So this is also a, a possibility of facilitating. Um, voting uh, for persons with disabilities across the European Union. Let me go to the next slide, please. And here, um, what we also have uh, across the European Union, but again, it's not very homogeneous, a very heterogeneous implementation across the European Union in each member state. You see that in in, in uh, 15 countries, you have, and these are the ones in light blue, which provide a mobile ballot box, um, meaning that a mobile polling commission is coming to your home if you requested uh, a mobile polling commission. This is also the case in Ireland, but then you also see that in Sweden, in Finland, uh, Austria, my home country, Italy. Uh, this is not available, however, in uh, eight countries like Spain, France, Belgium, Greece, Cyprus, and um, in four countries, um, this kind of mobile bullet boxes are only available in certain locations like hospitals or or um, old people's homes. I would like to go to the next slide, please. Um, and now I would like to uh, provide you with two more. Uh, um, um, parameters which we looked into in the research which we contributed to the sixth um, uh, Europe Dis European Disability Forum handbook, um, uh, which was especially looking into the European elections. And here is the right to vote and the right to stand for election uh, for elections for persons with disabilities. Um, first, let me go into the right to vote on the next slide. You see here and um, that we have 13 countries which uphold the right to vote without exemptions. These are the ones in light blue. And then there are seven countries in orange, which are the ones which restrict voting for persons under guardianship. But here I have to add, there's an addendum because most recently Luxembourg has changed these laws and is now also providing full voting rights and stand the right to stand for all of its citizens. And um, in in the dark blue um, countries like Portugal, um, Czech Republic, Hungary, there is still a possibility of restricting the right to vote on an individual basis. Let me go to the last slide. Thank you. Uh, this is the right to stand as a candidate. This is only possible in eight European countries. So the full uh, suffrage rights granted by this United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability is only granted in eight countries. Now with Luxembourg, nine countries, that's Sweden, Germany, Denmark, um, Netherlands, Italy, Austria, and, and Spain, and all other countries, uh, 19 countries, they don't provide the right to stand yet to, per, to persons with disabilities. I would like to um, stop here and I'm uh, looking forward to your questions and uh, happy to answer them if you have any particular questions about it. Thank you.
Thank you very much for that insightful presentation, Armin. And I think it's very encouraging for Irish people to realise that there's only one real instance where Ireland is an outlier, and that's in relation to the early voting. So I think overall we're not doing too badly. Um, so I think we're going to take the Q&As at the end of this session, if that's okay with uh, the other speakers. And uh, so our next speaker now is Nalika. She's the Deputy Head of the Electoral Office of Estonia. And Nalika is going to present on accessible elections in Estonia. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank all the participants uh, who have considered these topics uh, important enough to attend and think long. It's, there are so many of you, so thank you, sincerely. As you said, uh, I work as a deputy head of uh, state electoral office, and our office is responsible for organizing elections in Estonia, and we have to make sure that uh, voting is accessible for everyone. Uh, I have a slide here, yeah. Uh, in Estonia, we apply the principle of universality, uh, which also benefits voters with uh, special needs. This means that uh, we make voting convenient and accessible for every voter. And we don't want people with disabilities to feel any worse when it comes to voting. Voting is a fundamental right, regardless of someone's special needs. Voting must be possible and convenient to all. Each voter can choose whether a voter wants to vote at the polling station, at home when uh, he or she has uh, health issues, or in the inst institution where he or she is staying, or maybe voter feels comfortable voting at home with computer. If the voter is in, on a holiday in a foreign country, uh, then uh, they can vote on a computer or an embassy or by mail. But in Estonia, you cannot vote by mail um, in a national level. You can only do this when you are on a holiday or abroad or living abroad. Because in our opinion, it is not convenient for the voters uh, to vote uh, with uh, postal voting. But uh, we think that it's essential when you are abroad, because otherwise you would have to go to the embassy and it's very un unconvenient. And as you heard, uh, the voter must vote uh, him or herself. Uh, you cannot vote for someone else. I think it's called proxy voting. However, the voter can be assisted if necessary it can be, assistant can be anyone except the candidate, of course. Although <laughs> we apply universal principle, we have, uh, we have some special requirements, for example, in terms of giving information. Information must reach to all voters. Those the information is available in easy to read language, sign language, audiovisually with subtitles. In order to talk more precisely about accessibility in Estonia, I think I have to first introduce you to uh, our historical heritage. You may know that Estonia belonged to Soviet Union uh, from 1940 to 1991, and we were occupied by Russia. Interestingly, there were no disabled people in Soviet Union, right? Uh, this does not actually mean that they didn't actually exist, but they were hidden from the public uh, in closed institutions. And let it be noted that they were only given shelter and food there, but not necessary services. And at night, they were kept in groups behind locked doors. Disabled people were not seen on the streets. All buildings and streets were designed and built for so-called healthy people. During the Russian occupation, uh, most public buildings like schools, kindergartens, municipal buildings, cultural houses were built in Estonia. 
So we have big problems with physical uh, accessibility. Uh, but we have tried to improve it over the years. But also, uh, we have problems communicating with disabled people. Because this is not a familiar situation for current uh, generations. And they tend to avoid communicating with them. They're afraid. This is a brief introduction to help you understand uh, what we do on accessibility issue. In Estonia, voters do not have to register to vote because all voters are automatically on the voters list. As I mentioned, uh, mentioned we consider it very important uh, that information reaches to every voter. Therefore, an information sheet is sent mostly electronically to every voter, where you can find where and when to vote, how you can order ballot box at home, where you can find information about candidates, and how you can vote electronically. Such an information sheet is also in easy to read language. The official election webpage has video about the elections with uh, subtitles and sign language. We also send information intended for voters with special needs through our NGO, Estonian Chamber of People with Disabilities, which has its each unit in every county and the information reaches to every voter. I do think that voters in Estonia cannot complain about uh, the lack of information, but I think that we can definitely improve this also regarding this matter. Do you remember that I said that mostly, most uh, public buildings in Estonia were built uh, in the Russian occupation time and were designed for not so-called healthy people? Yeah. Uh, polling stations are usually opened in public buildings. Therefore, we have set ourselves the goal that all polling stations should be physically accessible. To achieve this goal, we have educated local authorities on accessibility. We recommend that local governments open polling stations only in physically accessible locations. We also collect data from municipalities on which polling stations are accessible. It's an accountability mean, right? In uh, 2021, in local government elections, local governments themselves estimated that 81% of polling stations were accessible. And in 2023 election, they estimated that 98% of polling stations were accessible. So there's a bit of improvement, but we're not there yet. We cooperate with the Chamber of uh, People with Disabilities to whom voters with uh, special needs send their observation, observations about bottlenecks in accessibility of polling stations. There were no comments actually about the polling stations, but there was a comment about lack of accessibility regarding information and the campaign materials, etc. As I mentioned earlier, we apply principle of universality. For example, you can vote in Estonia during the entire election week. Voting starts on Monday and ends on Sunday. The voter is not tied to his or her polling station, thanks to the fact that we use an electronic voters list. From Monday to Thursday, a voter can vote in any polling station across Estonia. From Friday to Sunday, a voter can vote in any polling station within his or her constituency. Each polling station has at least one voting booth for a voter with special needs, but it's not actually labeled or marked. It's universally used. So, a a cardboard screen is placed on the table within which a voter in a wheelchair or just a voter who wants to sit can vote comfortably. Voter can also use a magnifying glass. And a voter who needs help of a sign language interpreter 
can use this option over the internet. Let me remind you that we have several generations in Estonia who have grown up knowing that there are no people with special needs and they do not know how to communicate with them. Therefore, I'm particularly proud of the fact that people with special needs themselves trained the polling station staff uh, how to communicate with the voter with special needs, how to establish contact with them, and, uh, and they will also uh, describe uh, what to do. So the voter with the special needs feel comfortable when voting. I believe that Estonians' uh, success story in terms of accessibility is the possibility to I vote. All voters can vote electronically. In Estonia, more than 51% of voters use this option to I vote. The voter app has support for the visually impaired persons on Windows, and in 2024, it will be also support Mac computers. For us, i-voting is the only option when a visu visually impaired voter can vote independently and secretly. This, of course, when voter knows how to use a computer, but in Estonia it's not a problem. <laughs> when voting electronically, the voter only needs a computer, ID card or mobile ID. Now I will tell you more about it. Uh, in general, I voting is simple and convenient. I have heard from blind voter that he liked using electronic voting because he could do it independently and secretly. In order to vote, the voter must download the program, which is the voter's application, from the official election web page to the computer. Then voter logs in using his ID and entering pin one to identify the voter. The voter application then shows uh, to the voter the candidates of his or her constituency. And then candidate chooses the preferable candidate. Uh, the voter then signs his or her choice by entering pin two, and then it's digitally signed and also encrypted and sent to the electronic ballot box. And within 30 minutes, the voter can use his or her smart device to check the arrival of his or her I vote and who he or she voted for. At the moment, there is a discussion at the political level whether I voting could also be possible in smart devices, not only computers. But uh, there is no clarity of that topic, and the law definitely needs to change before that but uh, it would be probably more convenient for voters uh, when voting uh, by computer. So we see what the future brings. Now I will tell you uh, more about how to engage people with disabilities. Um, as I mentioned, voters with special needs themselves, they train the staff of polling station to make voting as pleasant and possible for voters with special needs. We encourage local governments to include people with special needs as staff members also. We collect feedback from voters uh, and uh, we, we deal with this info and make it better. Uh, also, I will um, tell you some challenges which are not on our control. Uh, the campaign materials, as I mentioned, and the, the information about candidates' political views. Uh, but we also have to tackle some issues, uh, what uh, we can change, like the ballot paper and the information about candidates. And uh, this is, and we also have uh, this 1% uh, accessible polling station goal. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Nelika. Again, that was very interesting and very interesting to learn of the i-voting, uh, the concept of a voting week, and most importantly of all, that people with disabilities train the polling staff. I think that's a really innovative and welcome um, development from Estonia. So our next speaker is Cahir Hughes, who is head of the Electoral Commission in Northern Ireland. Thanks, Annette. Good morning, everybody, and, and thank you to the, uh, the NDA uh, for their invitation to present to you today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our work across the UK in terms of um, encouraging participation, a little bit about our statutory responsibilities, and then some recent legislative changes that have come in to uh, improve accessibility to the polls. Uh, just a little bit about us, uh, the Electoral Commission is an independent body set up by the UK Parliament back in 2000, so we're a little bit older than, a good bit older than the Irish Electoral Commission. Whether we're any wiser, I'll leave that for others to judge. Um, our main role is we oversee the delivery and administrations um, of elections across the UK and also regulate um, political finance. Uh, we have a key duty to promote confidence uh, in the democratic process, and I'll touch a bit uh, more more on that in the next slide, uh, and we are accountable to many masters. Uh, we uh, regularly up against it towards the UK Parliament, uh, the Scottish Parliament, and the uh, Welsh Parliaments, um, not the Assembly, but we'll not get into that in the north. Um, so, a little bit about our campaigns and partnerships. Uh, a significant part of our budget goes into providing people with information on how they can participate uh, in the polls. Uh, we have some examples on screen there of our GOT5 campaign, which has run for a number of years, where we tell people it takes five minutes to run the bath, boil a kettle, to take that time to register to vote. Uh, in the north, back in 2021, there was a canvas of all electors, and we did a huge campaign to try and get as, as many people onto the electoral register, which uh, is the case now. I think there's 1.3 million just over that uh, in Northern Ireland, which is the highest uh, number ever. I probably should caveat that while we'd like to take the credit for that, the Northern Ireland executive at the time we're handing out £100 vouchers in response to COVID. Um, again, others can judge why people might have registered. Um, but a key part of all of our campaign work is working in uh, partnerships with organisations that know their audiences uh, and know how to communicate them and what their, their needs are. And in more recent times, we've moved into the area of political uh, literacy and political education so that people don't just have the tools um, to register to vote, but also understand um, what they're voting for. And that's also backed up with a public information system and media relations team, which really tries and get as much information out there as possible. Uh, just on that partnership work, um, it is, it's key for us, really, in terms of, of reaching target audiences. Uh, we work very closely with volunteer groups like uh, Mencap uh, across the UK, who are represented in the various parts of the UK. They're the sort of sector for people with learning difficulties. Uh, we also work very closely with the RNIB, the Royal National Institute for the Blind, um, promoting voter awareness, promoting electoral registration, and moving into that territory of um, political literacy and democratic uh, engagement. A little bit now in terms of what we're required to do um, as the Commission. Uh, we have a duty in Northern Ireland to produce a disability action plan. Uh, we're currently in the final year of that three-year plan. And under, this, under legislation in Northern Ireland, um, we are required to have due regard to the need to promote positive attitudes towards disabled people and encourage participation uh, by disabled people in public life. This doesn't apply uh, anywhere else in the United Kingdom. It only applies in Northern Ireland, but it is the default for position for us across the UK as good practice. We do that work across the UK, not just in Northern Ireland. Um, examples of some of the work that has come out of the Disability Action Plan is that we have worked closely with local authorities in Great Britain and with the Electoral Office in Northern Ireland to target key groups and give them information about uh, the need for photographic ID in polling stations. Uh, we've worked to make sure that voter resources are available in a range of accessible formats, um, Easy Read, British Sign Language, Braille and so forth. And uh, recently in England, we commissioned the British Deaf Association to deliver a roadshow uh, on voter ID in the areas of England. Internally, um, as well, we ensure the disability action plans uh, ensures that we consider the needs of disabled voters when we're doing our planning, corporate plans, annual reports, and so forth. 
Uh, in terms of recruitment, uh, we ensure that all those that are involved in the recruitment process have training around disability awareness and how they can support candidates. Um, and I think it's the key thing to highlight in all of this, this is a statutory duty. If we do not meet um, the requirements that we set out, then we will fail and we will have the Quality Commission for Northern Ireland on our back. But so far, so good. Um, the final thing I want to touch on is some recent changes uh, made by the UK Parliament through the Elections Act uh, 2022. And it introduced significant uh, changes across the administration of elections in the UK. The, the, the headline one was the introduction of uh, voter ID at polling stations in England, Scotland and Wales. We're very experienced in Northern Ireland, um, having it for over 20 years. Um, but that sort of was the, the big talking point and where a lot of political friction, I suppose, uh, arose. But one of the other significant changes it made was around the support that was available to um, disabled voters at polling station. It, it put a duty on the Electoral Commission to produce guiding, guidance uh, for returning officers on how polling can be made more accessible and also a duty placed on returning officers to have due regard um, to our guidance. Um, the guidance went through a considerable consultation process uh, towards the end of last year and our, uh, was published uh, back in February, just before local council elections in uh, May in England uh, and Northern Ireland. The guidance tries to strike a balance between what administrators can effectively do, but also what, what, what voters need. But we do set sort of minimum uh, requirements that we would expect to see in polling stations to uh, support voters. Um, and also in response to the consultation using language from the, the social model of disability, which one of our speakers had previously mentioned. Um, this all came about uh, as a result of the uh, High Court action back in 2019, um, whenever the High Court found that the tactile voting device used in polling station uh, was undermining the secrecy and uh, of the ballot for blind voters because the presiding officer or companion had to read, read it out to them. So that really was the catalyst uh, for change that was within the Elections Act. Um, some examples of what that looks like. Um, Northern Ireland was one of the first uh, parts of the UK to sort of implement this legislation with the local elections that were back on the 18th of May. Uh, the Chief Electoral Officer in Northern Ireland um, set up an online page on their website where any voter could go on there and request additional, any additional support that they might need in their polling station and just make that request there. They also purchased a significant number of hearing loops that again were available on request, encouraging voters if they needed that support just to request it through the online process. Uh, and a partnership with the RNIB, the Royal National Institute for Blind, an audio solution uh, was set up where voters could ring a free phone number in the polling station and, and hear what the options were on the ballot paper. Uh, in terms of the impact of that, it is early days. Uh, in Northern Ireland, just under half uh, of the voters that we surveyed uh, thought that they had the equipment, information and support that they needed to vote. Uh, that figure is slightly the same, uh, just slightly higher uh, at the local elections in England. In terms of the support that they got from staff within the polling station and felt that they were sufficiently trained and able to support them, uh, I think it was just over 60% in Northern Ireland and 40% in, in England. And I think what's very clear for us from that is that it, there's a, a lot more that, that, that needs done. Um, I mentioned the online support system that was set up by the Electoral Office for Northern Ireland. No requests uh, were made for any uh, additional support, which was disappointing, um, but a step in the right direction. I think what it clearly shows is that there's a significant amount of work of awareness raising to be done to ensure that disabled people are able to participate in the, uh, the electoral process. And I think very much there's a onus on the electoral community across the UK and, and, and civic society to ensure that disabled voters are aware of the support that's available and are able to participate. Thank you. Chief.
Thank you very much, Car. A very informative, interesting Thank presentation you. again. And without putting undue pressure on our newly established electoral commission, <laughs> I'm sure they will uh, read with interest uh, your reports. I thought it was very interesting about the guidance and the emphasis you place on that. Um, I've previously highlighted that the National Disability Authority have a really good uh, checklist to be used in Ireland, but whether it's actually used is debatable. Mm. And I think the post-election report is a really good idea. And you know, if you want to find if something is working, you go to the source. Absolutely. Um, so uh, enough of uh, my observations. I know people online have been sending in questions, and Carly is going to uh, read the questions from the online audience, and then we'll go to the people who are physically here. Thanks. Um, so the first question is from Leo, Physical Impairment Ireland, and it's in relation to what you said, Annette, about Armin's presentation. Can you please explain again how Ireland is an outlier in relation to early voting? Armin, would you like to take this question? Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, regarding early voting, I, I, I presented a slide where um, early in-person voting is possible in 11 um, member states of the European Union, Ireland not being one of them. I think that was the, um, that was the outlier in the terms of of Ireland, which you mentioned, um, but um, it, it, it just means, and, and that's what I wanted to emphasize as well in my presentation, each country has its own history of voting and electoral system. So each country has found different ways of facilitating um, accessible voting for those who are homebound or who are not um, in country on election day. However, we see in a number of European member states that there is no possibility to vote in advance or by post or um, have any, any possibility of accessing polling stations. So, and here there's a lot of uh, room and scope for improvements. I wouldn't think um, Ireland has um, any, any um, um, need here to in, uh, introduce early um, in-person voting um, as other countries have yeah but it's, it's always the kind of mix which is um, useful to understand whether there is sufficient and reasonable uh, accommodation of the right to vote and that's the importance of it that um, you know let's take the example of Malta um, you don't have the possibility of postal voting. You don't have the possibility of um, voting from home by a mobile ballot. You only have the possibility of accessing physically an early polling station or to go on election day to the polling station to vote. So, and, and from this perspective, it's not it's not a reasonable accommodation of the right to vote. And in, in this respect, we point out uh, scope for improvement, remind member states about their uh, ratified international standards and commitments to fulfill and bring that to the attention of the authorities, but also advocate for reforms in order for uh... Thank you. Carly, are there any other questions online or will we go to the audience here? Okay. Uh, so uh, we're running out of time, so we can only take one question from the floor. I hope you'll understand. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, Car, can I ask you a quick question? So. You know how Northern Ireland there's proportional representation, yet in the UK there isn't. Do you think one of the key issues in England at the moment, besides making sure people of multiple demographics, not just disability, are represented, do you think that, why do you think the main reason there's no proportional representation in the rest of the UK? Thank you. 
Why is there no PR in their SDK? Or are they moving that way? Is that what you mean? Uh, yes. Um, I suppose the short answer is no. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think the political appetite uh, is there for electoral reform in, in Great Britain. There was a referendum back in 2011 to move to an alternative voting system, um, and that was, was rejected, and it's certainly not part of the political debate. STV, the single trans variable vote, has been about in Northern Ireland since year dot, uh, like it is in the rest of Ireland. And I suppose it's perceived to be that given the sort of the, the, the conflict and um, the polarisation of politics in Northern Ireland, that it's deemed to be that's per, that, that fits there, whereas in England, Scotland and Wales, um, less so. Probably worth highlighting that in Scotland and Wales there are forms of proportional representation that are used for the Scottish Parliament and for the Welsh Parliament. And Welsh uh, councils are looking, at, some of them are of moving to a system of proportional representation. So that devolved level of the UK, I think there's the appetite for it. But at a national level in Westminster, I, I don't think that would be something that's on the horizon. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Great. Well, uh, before we close this session one, I'd like to thank uh, Armin, Melika and Cara for joining and sharing their very insightful uh, observations with us. And session two will take place now in a few minutes. <laughs>